Um, so I'm ha really happy to introduce Dr. Anna Avery from CSU. We're going to give her a promotion because she's getting a promotion in three months, right? One can only hope. Right. She's a full <laughs> professor um, in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Pathology at CSU. Anna and I have known each other a long time because we met back in my national and Jewish days. And she's here to talk with us uh, a little bit about some of her research. But Anne has been on our SAB. Um, so thank you, Anne, for being on our SAB. And she's been a Morris and Long Foundation funded researcher as well. So welcome, Anne. Thank you. So I run the. Um, well, I used to call it the Clinical Immunology Lab, and now we're rebranding. We're going to be the Clinical Hematopathology Lab at Colorado State. Um, Morris has played a big role in many of the things that we do, and I'll try to highlight those as I go through. So what I wanted to do is to talk a little bit about the diagnostic work that our lab does and how that integrates with the research questions that we're interested in. And I'll um, show you one of the studies that we at the end, one of the studies that we did, it's sort of parallel to the, to the lifetime study. So first of all, um, one, of the, one of the main things that we do is we test uh, dogs and cats for the presence of lymphoma. And lymphoma and leukemia are sort of interchangeable words, so I'm just going to use the word lymphoma. Um, and I want to talk, first talk about why that testing is so important. And the reason why is that if, if someone tells you their dog has lymphoma or a friend has lymphoma, that doesn't mean much more than saying that someone has diabetes, because it could be type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. And those are two completely different diseases. They have sort of similar clinical manifestations at the end, but they have different causes, different treatments, and different preventative measures. Similarly, lymphoma is amazingly heterogeneous. And it's heterogeneous because every different kind of lymphoma comes from a slightly different type of cell. So lymphoma is cancer of lymphocytes, but there are many, many different kinds of lymphocytes. And so when they become neoplastic, depending upon what kind of lymphocyte transforms to be a tumor, um, you get very different disease manifestations. This is a graph that um, most of the people in my lab use when we, when we present data to illustrate this. This is data curated from the literature. And what you're looking at um, from left to right are a variety of different forms of lymphoma and the median survival in days that are associated with those different forms. So all the way over here on the left is something called uh, lymphoblastic lymphoma slash leukemia. And for the veterinarians in the audience, we would know this as acute leukemia, but it's a precursor neoplasm. The median survival of that disease is 15 days from diagnosis, and that's with treatment. So it's a terrible disease. Um, on the other end, there are uh, indolent lymphomas, T-zone lymphoma, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more, and uh, something called B-cell, small cell, uh, CLL, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And then for the veterinarians in the audience, um, I've colored uh, the tumors that are derived from T-cells in blue and B-cells in green, and that's just to illustrate that one of the common misconceptions about lymphoma amongst the veterinary world, including oncologists, is that T-cell lymphomas are bad. B cell lymphomas aren't quite so bad, but you can see that diff the range of survivals is, is mixed between those two different tumor types. So one of the main goals of our di the diagnostic portion of our lab is to tell people what kind of lymphoma their patient has and to give them some prognostic information um, as well as some potential treatment information. And so this illustrates um, two different kinds of lymphoma that are known generally as T cell lymphomas but they're derived from different kinds of T cells. So on the left is a fine needle aspirate from a lymph node of a dog. Um, and on the right is a fine needle aspirate from a lymph node of a different dog. This was a boxer, and this was a golden retriever. Both of these dogs were diagnosed with lymphoma just by the pathologist looking at the cells on the slide. Um, and probably as recently as eight years or so ago, both of these dogs would have been given um, aggressive chemotherapy if the owners were inclined to treat, or given a poor prognosis if the owners were not inclined to treat. Okay. But because of the testing that we and others have developed, um, we now know, based on some testing that I'll describe in a second, that this lymphoma from the golden retriever is known to be indolent, and usually veterinarians just monitor these dogs. Um, and sometimes if they don't have any clinical signs, they, they won't treat them at all. Um, on the other hand, we, know, we knew that this lymphoma 
um, was an aggressive kind of T-cell lymphoma, very common in boxers. And so that dog was treated with aggressive chemotherapy, which meant uh, intravenous therapy. It's quite expensive for owners to um, undergo. So the golden retriever on the right, um, at the time that I put this together, was alive two years after diagnosis. His lymph nodes were getting big enough, they were interfering with his breathing. So he was started on a much more mild form of chemotherapy, prednisone and chlorambucil. Um, and this dog, based on what we know about this disease, will probably die of something else. It's usually older dogs that get this and something else um, does them in. The dog on the left, though, um, went into remission, came out of remission, and then was euthanized because of a declining um, quality of life. So, Again, one of our main goals is to be able to give that information to veterinarians and their owners what, what to expect from this particular disease. And then the second, our second goal is sometimes it's quite difficult for a pathologist to tell whether an animal has lymphoma or an animal just has, like say, um, you know those little Yorkies where their teeth are horrible, um, they get like bacterial infections. So sometimes their mandibular nodes are big and you aspirate those nodes and there's a lot of cells in there, and, and sometimes um, some of the cells look suspicious to the pathologist, but we don't really know for sure. And I didn't mean to insult Yorkies. I'm just probably a Yorkie owner in here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so on the, this um, is a fine needle aspirate from a dog that has lymphoma, and I think almost anyone who's ever looked at aspirates could tell that this is lymphoma. The cells are big, and they have these things called nucleoli. And so this is not a diagnostic dilemma. This is a, an aspirate from a, a mandibular lymph node. And the, I'm not a clinical pathologist, but they tell me that some of these cells are suspicious. So these little guys here are suspicious. But there's a whole bunch of different kinds of cells in there. And when you have a lot of different kinds of cells, one possibility is that this is just an immune response to an infection. Okay. So the other goal of our testing is to take that um, sample on the lower right there and help a veterinarians determine if there's really lymphoma or if the dog just needs some antibiotics and a dental. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about those methods um, because they're really important to everything that we do. So the first big assay that we do is called flow cytometry. And the way, the way we use flow cytometry is we use it to characterize the proteins expressed by the cells that are involved in the disease process. So if you took a whole bunch of normal lymphocytes and spread them out on a slide, you could not tell the difference between them by eye. But we know they're different because they express different proteins on their cell surface. Okay. And so if you want to know what kind of lymphocyte is present, um, you can determine that by using um, reagents called monoclonal antibodies. And those monoclonal antibodies are specific to different proteins that are found on the surface of cells. So what is illustrated here is here's one kind of T cell called the CD4 T cell. Here's a different kind of T cell called a CD8 T cell. These two cell types have very different functions, but they're both lymphocytes. Okay. And so if we want to know um, how many and what proportion of different cell types are in a sample, so for example, a lymph node or peripheral blood, um, we can take monoclonal antibodies that specifically recognize these different proteins and incubate a suspension of cells with these antibodies. The antibodies are conjugated to a, a color, a fluorescent molecule that will emit a color when a laser light hits it. Okay? So when we take the suspension of cells that we have stained with different antibodies and run them through a flow site, an instrument called a flow cytometer, we can count how many CD4 T cells there are, how many CD8 T cells there are, et cetera. To, um, lymphoma, by definition, is an expansion of a a clonal population, so a single cell type. So if you have a dog with a big lymph node, and all the cells in that lymph node are of one type, they're either all, oops, sorry, I lost my thing, they're either um, all CD4 T cells or all CD8 T cells. That's a strong indication that what you have is a tumor rather than an infection, which usually involves multiple different cell types, okay? So the flow cytometer um, is a fantastic instrument. Um, we love our flow cytometer. It's got a name. Um, we pamper it. Um, the, way that the, the way that it works is you, you have a suspension of cells. You've stained with all these antibodies, so they're, the cells are coated with different... Uh, I know the problem. No, nope, I was putting my finger over it, which doesn't really help much. All right, then. Um, so, 
so we, we take the suspension of cells, several hundred thousand cells. We incubate them with um, antibodies that are conjugated to different colors. And then the fluidics of the instrument allows these cells to be um, focused into a single stream. And that single stream of cells, so, sorry, a stream of cells that pass by a laser light in single file, so one cell at a time. So it's a really narrow stream of fluid. Every time the laser light hits a cell, it, it, it causes the fluorescent mo molecule to emit like a little packet of light that is picked up by a detector on the other side of the stream. And that, that cell then gets counted as a red cell. And in this case, that means it's a CD4 T cell. When this cell goes by that laser light, it will, um, light will be emitted of a different color. And the detector will say, OK, that's a CD8 T cell. So we can count all the cells in the suspension, and we know what they express. So um, what I, I wanted to just give you an example of what we look at when we make the diagnosis of lymphoma. On the left is a normal lymph node. And all the cells that were identified as being CD4 T cells are colored in red. Each dot here is a cell. And it's plotted here on the x-axis based on the size of the cell. So large cells would be over here, and small cells would be over here. And we don't have to worry about the y-axis for now. So in a normal lymph node, some percentage of the cells are CD4 T cells. The other cells are a whole bunch of different types of lymphocytes. This is a dog with T cell lymphoma. Okay, and you can see two things. The vast majority of the cells are CD4 T cells, so it's a homogeneous population of neoplastic lymphocytes. And you can also see that they're much larger than what you would find in a normal lymph node. So this allows us not only to make the diagnosis of lymphoma, but we know what type. It's a CD4 T cell lymphoma. We don't look at just one protein at a time. We look at about 18 different proteins at a time. And the constellation of proteins that are expressed on the surface can allow us to very specifically subtype these different forms of lymphoma. Does that make sense? I'm happy to take questions if you guys want to interrupt me. How does the flow cytometry indicate size? That's a great question. It's the, um, it's the length of time. Here's the best way I can describe it. The light hits the cell, and the cell casts a shadow. The photomultiplier tube not only detects the, the um, the photon of light, it also detects the size of the shadow. It's, it's vague, but you know. <laughs> it's what I tell the vet students when I teach them this. OK. So there's a lot of really great things about um, flow cytometry. It, it can give you a very specific subtype. It is relatively inexpensive, $115. That's what we charge, I have to say. A lot of our stuff gets run through the big diagnostic labs like Antec and IDEX. So to the owners, sometimes this test is very expensive, like $600. But we're getting 115 of it. Um, if you have a good dog, they don't need anesthesia. You can just go in there and take an aspirate of the node. Um, so that the other way to make this diagnosis is with a biopsy. And that often uh, requires either general anesthesia or at least sedation and local anesthesia. So it does save owners money. Um, and it, it can also subtype a little more efficiently than, than uh, an actual biopsy. The only downside is that samples have to be fresh, so they have to send them to us overnight with some particular um, specific shipping instructions. So that's, that's one method we use to make the diagnosis. The second method that we use to make the diagnosis is called the PAR assay. PAR stands for PCR, for antigen receptor rearrangements. And the goal of this assay, and this assay was, um, I'll talk about how Morris was involved in, in this assay. So the goal of this assay it's a very sensitive method for detecting neoplastic or cancerous lymphocytes in the context of an otherwise um, normal population of lymphocytes. So for example, a very early case of lymphoma can be readily detected with this assay, whereas it's harder to detect with histology and even with flow cytometry. Okay. Um, the principle behind the assay is the unique genetic makeup of individual lymphocytes that eventually give rise to cancer. So if we took 1,000 skin cells from anybody in the room um, and compared the genes in those skin cells, as long as they're from the same person, the genes in those skin cells would be absolutely identical to one another. If you take 1,000 lymphocytes, the genes in those lymphocytes would be identical to one another with one exception. And that's the gene that encodes the, the protein that recognizes foreign antigen or, or pathogens, viruses, bacteria, et cetera. Okay. So, so lymphocytes have a unique gene. And in particular, the size of that gene is unique to each different lymphocyte. 
And that's the principle that we use to detect um, cancer, and I'll show you what that, what that means. So um, my first Morris Animal Foundation grant was <laughs> frighteningly in 1999, and I, that was a jolt when I was putting this talk together. So that was 20 years ago. Um, so a really smart molecular biologist in our lab named Rob Burnett um, took this, this assay. He adapted it from human medicine, where um, it was initially described as, uh, by someone in Australia. Um, but was, this was a hard job for him to do because we have the entire canine genome now. But we didn't have it back then, so he had, to, he had to be really creative in developing this assay. So we developed the assay to detect these unique genes, and then we wrote a grant to Morris, um, and the overall objective of the work was to establish methods for diagnosing malignancy that result in less discomfort for the patient, less cost for the owner, and better rates of detection so that we can improve the quality of life for patients and owners. And I think we were quite successful at this because this assay is extremely broadly used now. So we do a lot of it, but many other labs have now picked it up and also start to do this. And it's helpful in ways that I can't even begin to enumerate. And I don't get credit for this. Rob, this molecular biologist, did all this work. So the, the, the basic principle behind the assay is, as I mentioned, if you have um, a, pop, a normal population of lymphocytes that are, each of them are different, the size of this particular gene is going to be different in each um, of those lymphocytes. And so when you extract DNA, if you measure the size of this gene, you'll get a very heterogeneously sized population of um, gene products. On the other hand, because lymphoma is basically one lymphocyte going rogue and, and dividing, if all, the, if all the lymphocytes in your sample are derived from a single clone, they're all going to have exactly the same size gene. So we, the way we do this assay is we get a sample from a patient, again, an aspirate, some blood, cells we scrape off a slide. Um, <clears throat> and it's a, it's a PCR-based assay, and I won't go into the detail. But in the, the end result is an analysis of the size of, this in, of these individual genes. So what you can see on the left, on the x-axis is the size of the gene. And you can see that there are multiple different sized genes in this heterogeneous population. So this is a normal lymph node or lymph node responding to infection. On the right is a single size product. And that's because all of the cells that contributed DNA to this reaction had exactly the same gene. It turns out because of the kinetics of the PCR reaction, you don't actually have to have all the cells in the sample being from, derived from the same clone. You can has, have as few as one in 100. So it, it can detect down to 1% neoplastic cells. So it's, very, it's useful for looking at dogs in remission, for example, and asking if, if there's still neoplastic cells there. So it's a PCR-based assay. Um, relatively few cells are necessary. And because it's a DNA-based assay and DNA is very hardy, it can be done on old samples. It can be done on samples that have been mistreated in all kinds of ways. Um, does anybody know who this is? That was the frozen guy in the Alps. Exactly, right. <laughs> so that's, this is Otzi. And I'm just putting him up here to illustrate how tough DNA is. So he was found in the Italian Alps, I think, mm -hmm. by some hikers. And they're like, oh, I came up on a murder scene. But it turns out he's about 5,000 years old. And what was so great about this is by looking at his DNA, they actually found relatives of his still living in the area of the Alps, which had to be an awkward conversation when you <laughs> knock on the door, like, found your great, 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 great grandfather frozen in the ice. The other really interesting thing is they went to his stomach contents, and they could speciate the deer that he ate as, as his last meal. Okay. My point being, DNA is tough. So, so the nice thing about this assay is it can be done on material that is archived if you have a retrospective study or in other ways uh, handled inappropriately. OK. So those are the two main assays um, that we perform. And Morris was very instrumental in getting the second one going. So the other, um, other thing that our lab does is research. And that's really the driving force behind everything we do. We use the diagnostic service to get samples to get data to generate hypotheses for studies that we'd like to do. So we're focused entirely on hematopathology, so um, lymphoma and leukemia. And we're interested in these diseases um, for the sake of dogs and, and helping dogs have a better quality of life, or at least an accurate diagnosis. But there are also diseases, because dogs are so inbred, and I'll show you what this looks like in a second, um, 
there are canine diseases that are common in dogs and uncommon in people. And we may be able to use the dog as a way of learning more about these uncommon diseases in people because we see them frequently in dogs. So when we, in the lab, get a sample sent to us for testing, we have an extensively curated database. So we beg veterinarians to give us complete medical records. Doesn't always happen, but when, they, when we get any information, we put it into the database. So that includes name, rank, and serial number, you know, breed, age, et cetera. It includes any imaging studies like radiographs, um, cytology, histology, all that goes into the database. So we have a really huge repository of information that we can use to better understand the epidemiology of these diseases. Um, it's all menu driven, so it's pulled down so people aren't free texting stuff and you know, using different abbreviations for things. Um, we, since samples come to us alive for flow cytometry, we also archive RNA when we can. We archive DNA for um, retrospective genetic studies. Um, and then when, when we have enough sample, we can also do functional studies. And I won't talk about that today, but one of the PhD students has done quite a bit of work on the function of some of the cells involved in lymphoma. We have a few other tests listed here, which I'm not going to talk about, but those are kind of in development right now. So the main research questions that we're interested in are um, what are the environmental and genetic risk factors for different types of lymphoma and leukemia? Um, what specific um, changes are present in those cells that drive oncogenesis? What signaling pathways are activated that might be targets of um, chemotherapy? So there's a lot of work now on receptor tyrosine kinases. And I don't know how much all of you guys see individual grants, but I'm sure you get a lot of them <laughs> targeting um, various kinds of chemotherapies. And then also, what are the human counterparts of these diseases? So we have 72,000 unique dogs in the database right now that were submitted for any and all testing. About 25,000 of those have, have fully subtype lymphomas, so we know exactly what kind of lymphoma or leukemia they have. So if you look at these 25,000 dogs, um, the, this is a, what this graph shows you is how many of each breed we have in the database. So of course, we always have more mixed breeds than anything else. I don't think anybody would be surprised to see that golden retrievers are coming in second labs, boxers. Um, I'll show you in a minute why I have divided these up into large and small breed dogs, because there's some interesting breed specific um, associations. I went to the 2017 AKC registry where they give you the, the, the um, number of registered dogs of each breed. And I realize that's not a great um, uh, replicate of what is actually out there, but at least kind of gives you an idea of who's registering what. Because I was interested in seeing if, we, if, if our patient population looks like the AKC registry. And so um, to some extent it does. Obviously, Goldens and Labs are pretty common. Um, but then there are also breeds that we, don't, we ver see very few of. So French Bulldogs, Poodles of the big and little type, um, Pointers we don't see commonly. And yet they're in the top 10 registered breeds with the AKC. Um, I'm not going to talk about English Bulldogs today, but as I mentioned at lunch, they have replaced Golden Retrievers as the most interesting breed we, we look at because they have these just fascinating diseases. Um, and some of them are really good and some of them are terrible. So, um, so one of the things that you start, we start to notice as we look at our data, we look at the breed specific components of our data, is really remarkable breed-specific predilections for different types of tumors. So this is just one um, example here. So on the left are the distributions of uh, dog breeds that develop um, something called small cell B cell lymphoma. We might also know it as chronic lymphocytic B cell leukemia. And then on the right are dogs that develop this very aggressive form of lymphoma called peripheral T cell lymphoma. And what you can see just by the colors is that small breed dogs way overrepresented in the group of dogs that get B cell CLL. Um, one possible explanation for that is that small breed dogs live a long time. B cell CLL is a disease of older dogs. And so perhaps um, that, you know, we don't see any German shepherds on here because they don't live long enough to um, get these diseases. I, I think that might be a partial explanation, but I will say that the disease I'm going to talk about, T-zone lymphoma, presents at, at the same age as small cell B-cell lymphoma, and we see a lot of golden retrievers. We almost, with, with T-zone lymphoma, 
golden retrievers are almost never seen with B cell CLL. We've seen a, a small number of them. My suspicion is they're just really big duct holders and their owners don't know the difference, but like, we'll have to do some more genetic testing to determine that. On the other hand, if you look at peripheral T cell lymphomas, you can see that almost all of these breeds are large breeds. So boxers, it's, this disease is so frequent in boxers that we see more boxers than we do mixed breed dogs with this particular disease. Um, golden retrievers, labs, and Australian shepherds are also highly represented in this group of dogs. And very, very rare um, small breed dogs for this disease. So I'm not, we, we have projects looking at both of those, and you guys have funded one, are funding one of my PhD students who's looking at B-cell CLL. Um, but I, last um, little bit here, I want to talk about this disease called T-zone lymphoma. T-zone lymphoma has been a subject of interest to us uh, as an immunology lab for a long time. Um, this is a disease that is seen in older dogs. The median age is around 10. It tends to be clinically indolent, so dogs um, will get this, and sometimes they'll need chemotherapy, sometimes they won't. Often, because they're older, they will die of something else before um, the T-zone lymphoma sort of over overcomes them. One of the most interesting features of this disease from an immunological perspective is that 10% of the cases have demodectic mange. And that's what this, this guy is a demodectic mange. So that's a, a mite that lives in the skin and causes um, skin you know, reddening and um, in, it's not uncommon in very young dogs. But when dogs are adults and they get this disease, it's commonly thought that they're immunosuppressed in some way. That 10% number has been remarkably consistent across studies. So there's a group in Japan who found that 10% of their T-zone cases had demodex. There's a group in North Carolina, uh, sorry, Pennsylvania that found that. And then we also found it in our study. So that, that's, a, I think, a pretty solid finding. I'm not going to talk about it today, but one of the PhD students in the lab has been looking at the function of, or looking at the potential reasons why there is immunosuppression. So that's a paper that will come out later on this year, I hope. Um, the most interesting thing about T-zone lymphoma is the marked breed-specific predilection. And so this is the distribution of breeds that, that develop this disease. Golden retrievers um, make up about 32% of all the cases that we see. We do see a lot of goldens overall, but they only account for about 12% of all the lymphomas and leukemias that we identify. So this is a really dramatic breed-specific predilection. The second most common breed is Shih Tzu's followed by labs and chihuahuas, and then a variety of, of other patients. So when I made this, we had um, seen 2,200 cases. Okay. So we have a lot of research questions about this disease, and I'm going to talk about the last one. But we have a PhD student looking at what the function of these cells are and, and um, where they come from. But our main research question, the, the question I want to just finish up with um, today, is what are the genetic and environmental or medical factors that predispose golden retrievers to developing T-zone lymphoma? So that led to a study we call the Golden Year Study. Um, and this is a, the owners in this study send us pictures, and they're fantastic. We've got dogs dressed up for, for St. Patty's Day, um, <laughs> dogs with Christmas hats on. So this is one owner who, and they gave us permission to use this. Uh, I don't have to put like little blackouts in front of their eyes or anything. Um, so, so this is one family of dogs, all of which contributed to the study. Um, so the, the Morris played a big role in this because we had trouble recruiting controls for the study. So the overall goal of the study was to take a group of dogs with T-zone lymphoma, which we see through our service. We identify them when they come in for diagnostics and then to reach out and get a group of control dogs that don't have T-zone lymphoma and ask the question, are there any differences in environmental exposures between those two groups? Is there any difference in the, their genes that might predispose them? So um, we got cases from, again, the samples that came into the lab. The controls we solicited from the same clinics that sent in cases. So we'd call the vet and say, you sent us a case. Can you get us a healthy golden? OK, not the easiest thing to do when you're looking at 10-year-old goldens. but that. That was a slow process, and so then we reached out to Morris. And in your, um, I, I guess you're calling it the CLIP Canine Lifetime Project? OK. Mm -hmm. So you guys had a bunch of mostly golden retriever owners register their dogs that were too old to be in the lifetime study, but still wanted to take part in, in a study. And so we reached out to them, and they were fantastic. I think you guys sent out like a mailer or some kind of alert. And I was the first one in the lab the day that it went out. And I, the first person I 
who called was crying already on the phone because she had just lost two dog, two goldens to Hemangio. And this isn't a Hemangio study, but she wanted to, you know, she wanted to help in any way she could. So th that was a really rich um, group of control animals for our study. This is just a distribution of where they are. There's no golden retrievers in Idaho apparently, but anyway. Um, all right, so this was the um, recruitment. We had uh, about 500 total dogs. All of the dogs were sent a medical history questionnaire, and that medical history questionnaire we derived from your lifetime study questionnaire. It was just, it was shorter. Um, and uh, that asked about, you know, toxins, rural versus urban, diet, supplements, which will be important in a second. It also asked what kind of medical, medical conditions these dogs had. Um, and then in a subset of them, we, we, well, we have DNA from everybody, but we used a subset of them for a genome-wide association study to try and identify genes that were predisposing. Okay. So in the paper that was published recently, um, Julia Labadee, who is a DVM PhD student, also funded by, in part by Morris, um, she looked at environmental risk factors. And it, it's a long study. I'm just going to give you the two main takeaways. The first thing she found was that when owners supplemented their dogs with omega-3 fatty acids, which are supposed to be anti-inflammatory as well as heart healthy, um, those dogs, the, the dogs in the control group were more likely to be supplemented with omega-3s than dogs in the, in the case group, which meant omega-3 fatty acid treatment seemed to be protective for T-zone lymphoma. And I'll come back to why that might be useful in the end. And then the second um, observation is that Dogs in the control group who didn't have T-zone lymphoma were more likely to be hypothyroid than dogs in the case group. And I'll talk about that in a second. There are other findings, but these were the two strongest uh, results. In the genetic risk factor study, which hasn't been published yet, but I'm going to show it to you because of it, it dovetails nicely with the environmental risk factors, um, we found that, that sorry, I'm, I won't go through what this whole plot is. This is what a genome-wide association study looks like. Each dot represents a different position along each of the canine chromosomes. And when that dot um, is above the line, which is the significance of association, it's associated with disease. Okay, so what we found was that there was a region on chromosome 8 that contained multiple um, genes that control thyroid function that was significantly associated with disease. They're SNPs, yes, thank you, right. I don't, know, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but yeah. Um, so when we looked in that region, chromosome 8, we found um, two genes that are related to thyroid function. We've actually gone on and sequenced this whole region. We don't find any um, coding changes in those two genes. Um, so this is still a work in progress as to what that association looked like. And I don't have a hypothesis for why hypothyroidism would be protective for T-zone lymphoma. So we're still co cogitating on that. Um, the second uh, area that we found that was uh, associated was this um, region on chromosome 14. And in that region, um, there are genes called hyaluronidase genes. So hyaluronidase is the thing is the, some of you guys may have seen it in cosmetic stores. It's a thing you put on your face to reduce wrinkles, I guess. I don't know. It's not working for me, but. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's the thing that makes your skin, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It keeps, what? Supple. Supple. Is that what you said? Supple. Yes, yeah. Um, sharp haze have a lot of hyaluronin in their skin. Um, that's also why they get sharp hay fever, different story. Um, so hyaluronin is a, is a uh, basically a big sugar. Um, so some genes involved in the breakdown of hyaluronin are found on this region of chromosome 14 that's associated with T-zone lymphoma. What's really interesting about that is that the exact same region was identified in a, in a genetic risk factor study for golden retriever susceptibility to mast cell tumors. So we found basically the same genetic region imposes susceptibility to both T-zone lymphoma and mast cell tumors. So um, we don't know why, but I would, this is our working hypothesis, and it also brings in the omega-3 finding. So our working hypothesis is that hyaluronin, which is broken down by those genes in that, in that particular region, um, when it's broken down, it induces inflammation. Inflammation um, results in the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, 
And pro-inflammatory cytokines that can activate both T cells and mast cells. And inflammation is known to be a driving factor for the development of various kinds of cancer. This also might tie into why omega-3s are protective in that, in, in that they're, in theory, anti-inflammatory, and they may help to mitigate some of these effects. I don't know if any of this is true, but at least it gives us a framework that we can go on and do some further hypothesis testing. So that's kind of where we are with that disease. So uh, this is my last slide. Um, I wanted to just sort of summarize what we've been able to do with T-zone lymphoma and with a lot of help from Morris, and that is look at both environmental risk factors as well as genetic, genetic risk factors. One other finding that came out of this study, which I didn't talk about, um, but which has recently been published, is we can also identify what we think are pre-neoplastic T cells in golden retrievers that don't have T-zone lymphoma. They're a very unique phenotype, and so they're easy to pick out in the peripheral blood. So we'd like to understand what the rate of progression from that pre-neoplastic condition is to full-on neoplasia. Um, and so some of our outstanding questions is how often do those transform, um, specifically understanding the role of the genes we identified, um, and then we won't talk about hemangiosarcoma. The other thing that we have, and we are, don't have plans to analyze this data yet, is we have histories, medical histories and outcomes on 500 golden retrievers over the age of nine. So that's a nice bit of data to mine. If you want to know what the end of the lifetime study is going to look, look like, these are the dogs at the end of the lifetime study. So that's another area that we want to investigate. Okay. The last thing is um, I just want to point out that, um, so these are all the PhD students in the lab. And you guys have supported Emily um, and Julia. Emily works on B-cell CLL. Julia did all the work on the T-zone study. Um, and that's all I have.